really important that we begin to change the mindset of young people to know that your vote counts. They don't understand that the legislative arm of government is actually a co-equal arm of government. We have an uh, incredible amount of potential. Whatever it is I was doing because of my personal DNA, it mm -hmm. had to be of an international standard. Which is what, seriously speaking, is all about. Welcome, this is Seriously Speaking. We're talking about agitation today and the Niger Delta. The Niger Delta's agitation actually began in the late 1960s over tensions between foreign oil corporations and a number of the Niger Delta's minority ethnic groups who felt that they were being exploited, especially the Oguni and the Ijoz. The agitations gave birth to several militant groups, and since then, the oil industry has been ravaged with violence, ranging from kidnapping to piracy and vandalism. Over time, the Nigeria's oil production fell from 2 million barrels to as low as 300,000 barrels per day as a result of these agitations in that region. Now, on the show today, it's, not, it's beyond the Niger Delta. It's about the whole of Nigeria. How far can agitation carry you? What causes agitation? And I uh, have in the, in the studio someone who is a militant to some extent, but the militancy's bullets are in his head. I'll take a break and I return and I meet my guest on the show today on Seriously Speaking. Well, my guest I've described as an intellectual militant, but actually was my lecturer long ago in the University of Ife when I was in the Dramatic Arts Department. Professor Zaria, welcome to Seriously Speaking. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's nice to have you. Great to be yeah. I say it all the time that when I, when I remember, there's a quote you had in those days when you were in Guardian in the editorial board, you used to write, and you said something about if an old man dies, it's like the library is set ablaze. <laughs> I mean, in my head, that remains in my head and forever. It it's just situates the importance of history. And that's why when I wanted to do this Niger Delta topic, I thought you'd be in the best position because you have figures and heads, I mean, in your head. And um, I asked you to share with me some images from the Niger Delta. And you shared with me images of bridges to show yeah. things that have happened. It means that agitation can still bring results. Sure. Right? Yes. So how did those bridges happen? Because you worked with a special assistant to um, the then governor, when Buri was governor in Delta State. And it was that time that those bridges were built? Sure, they were built then, yes. So tell me about- They were the longest bridges on the continent at that time. After this 11 kilometer one in Lagos? This one, the one you have in Lagos here, yes. was built in the 90s. Yes. It's, te it's called Ted Mayland Bridge. Mm -hmm. And we, it, we in the Niger Delta, we call it Niger Delta Oil Mayland Bridge because it's the oil that built it. That's, you have I'm talking one, of those ones that were built by that state government. You have the ones across to into Bomadi? Bomadi, yes, that's, that's across uh, River Focados, mm -hmm. which is a branch of the Niger. You have the that's one that, a kilometer long. You have the one that goes across to, to our boy, where your, I come your, from. Yes, your, yeah. Then you have the third one that goes across. Yeah, that's what is called uh, Ubatao Madino. Those were three bridges that mm -hmm. were built within those eight years yeah. of that regime. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. so, but you know, say, now, I started my, my intro talking about the militants in the Niger Delta. Yes. And when you think Niger Delta, you're thinking about agitating for your human rights with guns, right? Yeah, that is one of the weapons. From the way you have described it now, it is clear that without Niger Delta, there's no Nigeria. That's what you say? That's what it is. That's not what I say. That is what it is economically. That is what it, it is strategically. It is the resources. It is the revenue that comes from the oil and gas of Niger Delta that sustains the country. Mm. And this has happened for 50 years. If that revenue were retained in Niger Delta, there would be no agitations. The, that revenue is stolen by the federal government of Nigeria through all kinds of draconian laws and channels of injustice. Nigerian people are aware of some of them. The most important was decree number 51 of 1969. That decree just says that from this moment, any revenue that comes from oil and gas will now go to the federal government of Nigeria. Is that wrong? Nigeria needed to that's, be developed. That's an act of political and economic brigandage. The Nigerian that we have is made up of different parts. And those different parts make contribution to the survival of the country. You don't make a law seeing that every tax that is paid in Lagos, including the VAT that Lagos pays, must go to Abuja, and Abuja will determine who enjoys the tax. That is monumental injustice. This happened to Niger Delta with regard to the oil, 
Fortunately for Nigeria, or fortunately for us, Niger Delta, the oil has been the mainstay of the economy. No, so, choose one, fortunately or unfortunately? Fortunately for Nigeria. Nigeria is the one who enjoys the booty. Mm -hmm. the, the money goes to the federal government. The federal government uses it for whatever it likes. When, it was, when they were in Lagos, as the capital of Nigeria, they built overhead bridges here. I mean, our people were surprised. You build bridge on land? I mean, when you were looking for bridges over water there. They moved to Abuja in 1991, and they turned it to the most beautiful city on the continent of Africa. Where did that money come from? All of you from Niger Delta. The agitations you are seeing now are only one expression of a general long series of protests. And it has taken many forms. Sometimes take parliamentary form. People go to send it and so on to express. Sometimes it takes the idea of blocking access to oil facility. Sometimes you're environmental. But agitation. the one we hear more about is the brigandry. You know, but my question is, must we choose brigandry to get a message across? Where you kidnap oil workers, you demand to be paid something. Is it a function of some brigands taking over a cause that is just? It is a response to the, the manner in which the inequitable Nigerian Federation is run. When you compare notes, Niger Delta to other, other oil producing areas like the Middle East. Niger Delta is the most peaceful oil producing place on earth. To the Middle East. The whole Middle East, there's, there's war going there. World wars are going there. The Americans are fighting. ISIS is fighting. Iraq, that is war. That's over resources. We are still the most pacific. Now, it is only when there are agitations that interrupt the flow of the petrodollar that the rest of Nigeria become concerned. If it's not interrupted, as far as Nigeria is concerned, everything is going so on. So what I hear you say is that that's why they probably stop gas flow stations or bus pipelines or do things like that? It, it, that is the method that best suits the challenge that we face. Don't forget that the first armed protest over this exploitation was by Major Adakaboro. February 1966, he was the student union president of the University of Nigeria, Onsuka. He, he left school, he went to the police, left the police, and formed a guerrilla army. February 23, 1966, he declared Niger Delta Republic. Yes, 1966, a month after the 1966 coup in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So it's been a long history. But after that, of course, the military took over. And when military takes over, the duty of the military is to conquer and loot. They stayed in Nigeria for 33 years, and they conquered the country and looted it. Mm -hmm. There was no time to attend to those problems where resources were coming from. Any time that you agitated, they will make a decree. I'll give you one example of 1969 now. By 1971, they made other ones. By 1968, of course, the government said, all oh, air companies should leave the Niger Delta and come and that stay, was stay in Lagos. Oh, before they are still here now. Before 78? Before 60, my 68, they gave them instruction that if they stay there, Ojuku Biafra will bomb them. They should come to the federal capital to settle. They are here 50 years after the war. They are still here. Chevron is here. Uh, Ex Eximobil is here. Shell is here. They are all here operating and here in Abuja, we met Mr. President Muhammad Buhari. Mm -hmm. When you say we? On, on, we, I'm talking on behalf, on behalf of the group that is now intervening to ensure that dialogue is used to resolve the problem. Mm -hmm. And that group is called Pan Niger Delta Forum. The acronym is PANDEF, and I'm a, a leading member of that group. Mm -hmm. We met the president on November 1 at Aso Rock and gave him 60 points for negotiation. It is that intervention we made. That is why the oil is flowing now. It has got to 2 million barrels, and the, the Ministry of Petroleum Resources is celebrating. They are always happy when the money goes up, but they're not happy in doing justice to us, Niger Delta. Mm -hmm. But there's a ceasefire of six months that has allowed them to recover the number of barriers. Mm -hmm. If negotiation does not take place, 
And if the items we requested for are not attended Some to... Some of these items are like what? Because sometimes they, feel like they, they, settle de, uh, they settle leaders like you and then you keep quiet and you allow them to go through. That's what we hear. You know, we are, we are very involved. The f one of them, which was very Crucial. dramatic, mm -hmm. was the wicked policy of stopping the Nigeria Maritime University, Okere and Koko, from taking off. That was the legitimately established university. I was the academic consultant to it for three years. It met all standards, global and local. And the government established it by law, appointed vice chancellor, uh, uh, council members, and you have to take off. And one of the ministers, we are told, said, ah, who will go to school there? That's one of the conditions. The federal government last week, at early this week, has said it cannot open. We've lost two years, but one of the items have been resolved. There's another one, which is, these oil companies that Nigeria asked to move their operational headquarters mm -hmm. to foreign lands, we, have, we are going to give them ultimatum to all return to Niger data or they will shut their operations. The oil companies in America are mostly in Texas, San Francisco, and Alaska. Texas is a state where oil is produced and all the companies that deal with oil most of them are in Texas. They are not in Washington, D.C. When they are in Texas, it is the employer, people from there, lawyers, all kinds of insurance companies, mm -hmm. and the business there blows them. Nigeria is the only one where the oil companies carry their business. When, when Chevron comes here, they are in Lekki here. When they come here, they bring so many businesses here, driving, supplies, services. They are so, they are so, they are, they are so provocative that they even fly their workers from Lagos here to work in uh, Escravos. In the evening, they fly them back and they pay their tax here. We are going to give the ultimatum. If they don't return to Niger Delta, they will short operations. I'll take a break, you know, I'll take a break because when I come back, sometimes these oil companies probably are not there because it's not comfortable for them. I don't know, but you give me the history of how they've survived, at least why, the, the, how culpable the people in Niger Delta too it will, are. It will, be, it will be an act of gross Ingratitude. For I know people to say the place is not safe for them to stay, but it's safe for them to reap barrels of oil and gas every day, which they sell and make money from. Come on, we pass that stage of new colonialism. I'll be right back with Professor Gigi Dara if you don't go away. Well, welcome back. And I'll start here, Prof, by telling you, you'd say it would be unfair to say the Niger, De Niger Delta is not it's safe, safe. Ah. For, the oil, for the oil companies. That's not an excuse. That's an enemy so of Niger Delta, anybody who says so. OK, so they're used to being on that side. They've been there. They've been making money there for 60 years. How can they say that place is unsafe? Okay. How did they make the money from? I've told you that money beat Lagos, it beat Abuja, it beat Bauchi, it beat Joss, it beat uh, Kaduna, it beat Sokoto. Is that it... bad? Oh. It is unjust, she may say it's not bad, mm -hmm. that you divert, you channel the wealth of one section on that, on that develop that place, impoverish that place, and transfer through your illegal or your unjust laws and transfer that wealth systematically. Okay. So that every month, 36 states in Nigeria, only 10 of those states contribute to the Nigerian Treasury, only 10. Lagos is one of them. The other 26 are economic pariahs. They are ever parasites. They don't contribute. But once a month, they all gather in Abuja and share money. That is a worse robbery than what one the agitation you're talking about. But then it's a federation. A federation is not a club for robbery. A federation means the constituent parts of that federation have autonomy over their resources. Then they agree, like an old student association, mm -hmm. to make a percentage contribution to run a central government. That's what a federation means. Mm -hmm. The one we're running now is a unitary government, it's an empire, it's a source of provocation, and we are determined to end that exploitation. Thank you, Prof, for being my guest. Thank you for flying yourself all the way from Abraka to get here. You had one flight to catch all the way in Benin. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much. <laughs>